Hello and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Osman. In today's episode, the turtle nesting season is underway and a rare turtle has already nested on a Volusia beach. County advisory boards are looking for members and the Memorial Day weekend signals a boost in boater traffic in county waterways. Plus, Joanne Magley sits down with the Director of Emergency Management, Jim Judge. Those segments and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. I hope you stay tuned. Volusia County is seeing a lot of activity with sea turtles. Staff at the Marine Science Center in Ponce Inlet are celebrating the successful release of two sea turtles they rehabilitated at their turtle hospital. Peggy, a sub-adult loggerhead sea turtle, and Rowdy, a juvenile green sea turtle stranded in February, they were brought to the turtle hospital. After three months of care, both turtles made full recoveries and were able to be released back into the ocean. We of course keep making room for turtles as they come and dividing up tanks as we need to, but every one of our, our pools here is full with rehab turtles that are uh, at different stages of the, the rehab process. We have quite a few that are doing really well and we hope to get them back out to the ocean as soon as we can. And then some newer ones that have just come in that are still a little more critical that we're working on. Sea turtle nesting season is also underway and for the first time since 2014, a rare Kemp's Ridley sea turtle has made its nest on the beach in Volusia County. The Kemp's Ridley sea turtle was spotted on the beach making her nest in Daytona Beach Shores. We were able to get down there and uh, get measurements and get data and get the animal uh, tagged so that if she ever comes back to nest again or nest somewhere else or strands, she'll be able to be identified. And that's really invaluable data to the uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission and the different research groups around here to get nesting information from a species that doesn't typically nest here. If you see a nesting adult sea turtle or hatchlings making their way to the ocean, admire them from a distance and quietly watch this miracle unfold. If a turtle appears to be in immediate danger, notify a lifeguard or beach safety officer, or you can call the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission at 888-404-3922. For information about Volusia County's Sea Turtle Program, you can call 386-238-4668, or you can visit volusiaseaturtles.org. For questions about lighting, you can call 386-238-4668. 4773. Serving on an advisory board is a great way for citizens to get involved in the important issues that affect our community. These groups research and make recommendations to the Volusia County Council on a variety of topics including growth management, services for children and families, licensing for contractors, tourism marketing, funding for cultural organizations, and many more. During a recent meeting of the Historic Preservation Board, members reviewed the State Historic Marker Program and recognized locals who have worked to save the county's historic places. The Historic Preservation Board, which is one of Volusia County's 27 advisory boards, advises the Volusia County Council on matters related to historic preservation policy. I chose this particular board because I have a real passion for history and in particular, I have a real passion for Florida history. I'm a native of Florida, uh, and so I love Florida history. I love, I, I lived in a historic home. I love historic buildings, and I think it's really important that we preserve what we have, because when we lose a historic site or a historic structure, it's gone for good. It doesn't come back, and so we really need to preserve what we have. Volusia County has an exciting future, and we want you to be a part of it. We need your knowledge and expertise to prepare for the challenges ahead. The advisory boards listed on your screen have openings and are searching for members now. And it's an important uh, job, uh, it's a volunteer position, but it's an important part of our community here. Whatever it is, find that passion you have uh, and then you can apply for that and uh, even if you don't have that much experience, you can have, it's a good on the job learning experience. 
So really what you want to need to have is a desire and a passion to help and, and help your community. To learn more about Volusia County's advisory boards and to obtain an application, you can visit volusia.org slash advisory. Although Florida's boating season never really ends, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, also known as the FWC, wants to remind all boaters to remember safety first. As the boating capital of the world, Florida leads the nation with nearly one million registered vessels across the state and is known as a prime boating spot for residents and visitors. Each year, the FWC responds to far too many tragic and preventable boating accidents. The big thing with uh, a lot of boaters is uh, they'll come out and they're excited to uh, get underway on the boat and have a good time, uh, but they forget to possibly tell anybody where they're going and uh, you know, it just leads to a, a bad situation. Um, we just request that uh, you be responsible and uh, let somebody know where you're going, let your loved ones know, let a neighbor know, a friend, uh, basic, uh, a basic description. You know, uh, in the event of an emergency, uh, that helps local authorities and the Coast Guard uh, help to pinpoint where you might be. Um, now, what we're requesting only takes a little bit of a time and it'll save you, uh, save you a big headache. According to the recently released FWC 2015 Boating Accident Statistical Report, there were 737 reportable boating accidents in Florida just last year. Ten of those occurred in Volusia County. More than 64 percent of the 55 boating-related deaths confirmed last year were attributed to drowning, which life jackets were designed to prevent. A lot of the issue that you hear people say is that, you know, it's hot in Florida, they're a little bit bulky, they're hard to do whatever activity you're doing. Uh, there are specialty jackets that are inherently buoyant and they're defined for that activity and so they're defined to be more comfortable. And those jackets will, again, they'll save your life. You end up in the water unprepared, you've got your safety equipment right there with you. Over half of our fatalities every year, simple falls overboard uh, and the individuals end up drowning. If they had their life jackets right with them, their chances of survival are gonna be so much better. The FWC encourages boaters to report people who are operating boats dangerously by calling 888-404-FWCC or text TIP at myfwc.com. More information can be found by visiting myfwc.com slash boating. You can even search there for the Florida Boat Ramp Finder to help you find a great place to launch your boat. Whoa, why did you throw the trash out the window? What? Don't you know how long it takes litter to decompose? A cigarette butt takes one to five years. A plastic bag, 10 to 20 years. A glass bottle, a million years. You know, you're right. We should start caring more about the environment. Let's stop litter now. Keep Volusia County beautiful. Put litter in its place. Drive, Drive it home. home. One of the largest walk-in bathtub manufacturers in the world is located right here in Volusia County. In this week's Business Beat, Joanne Magley takes a look at the South Daytona business. Premier Care and Bathing is an international company with its national headquarters in South Daytona. Melissa Allman is the company's VP of Legal Affairs and Human Resources. Premier Care and Bathing um, came to the United States in 2002. We were the first company to bring a walk-in bathing product to the United States. They set up a headquarters here, one in California and one in Vancouver, British Columbia, and um, just started selling this product throughout the U.S. and it's just grown and grown over time. Premier Care and Bathing manufactures and installs a variety of walk-in baths and showers to promote independent living for the disabled and aging populations. The prices range from $5,000 to $30,000 depending on the type of tub and how much renovation is required in the bathroom. The primary consumers are older adults that have mobility issues or any other persons, including children, that have mobility problems with getting in and out of the tub and need a solution to bathe safer. The demographic of our country is getting older and um, more and more people want to be able to live at home. 
and we it's the aging in place market we call it it's the biggest growing market that there is and people want to be able to stay home they don't want to go to nursing homes they don't want to leave their homes and our product allows them to have independence and you know dignity and be able to stay in their homes and and uh, you know live their lives the way they want to while the manufacturing plant is located in North Carolina the company's CEO and CFO both work out of the South Daytona National Headquarters. All of the accounting, sales, and marketing functions are housed there, and it's also home to a large call center and warehouse. And I believe I'd be correct in saying that we're the only company that manages the process from the initiation of the contact with the customer all the way through to warranty. We manufacture our own products, we sell them, we install them, and we service them after installation. Premier Care and Bathing was the first bath and shower company to earn the ease of use commendation by the Arthritis Foundation. And the company also partners with AmVets. We have a, a great partnership with AmVets. Um, we um, do a lot, we're proud that we do a lot for veterans mm -hmm. in our company. We offer a, the standard VA discount to our veterans so they don't have to go through the, you know, the red tape that they may have to go through with the VA, we would just give them that discount to begin with. We're also partners with um, the Arthritis Foundation. We have the Arthritis Commendation for ease of use. Um, we send all of our products to be tested and for people that uh, have arthritis or other issues with their hands, our products are very easy to use. The company does about 8,000 installs each year and Almond expects that number to rise. Well, with the market that keeps growing, I can see Premier continuing to grow. I mean, we're bursting kind of at the seams here. We're hiring people every day. We're interviewing people and hiring them here. So uh, we're growing like crazy and I can see us, you know, expanding more and more in the future. For The Business Beat, I'm Joanne Magley. This week on Solutions for Your Life, Joe Seward shows how residents who are short on yard space can still enjoy fresh vegetables grown in their own garden. Hi, I'm Joe Seward and welcome to Horticulture Today. This is our alternative growing area, you might call it. Again, this being a demonstration and teaching garden, we want to show people different ways to grow edible crops at home. If you don't have very much space, if you have poor soil, there are still ways you can grow vegetables. Here we've created an, an arbor and we're growing cucumbers up the arbor. Again, it saves space. And oh, by the way, these cucumbers are growing in hay bales. These are seasoned hay bales. We seasoned them with some fertilizer beforehand, watered them a little bit of topsoil on top of them to top dress them, and we planted the cucumbers right in the hay bales. They're off the ground, makes it easier to harvest, no weeds, makes for very easy gardening. Here we have what are known as garden socks. This is a product that we actually sell here at the extension office. Again, you fill them with soil, you can plant a number of different crops in here. We've got squash planted in them. Here we've got Swiss chard. Uh, you can plant annuals and flowers in here. Uh, but again, if you live in an apartment or a condominium where you don't have very much space, you don't have any soil to work with, this is a way that you can grow things without having to have a traditional vegetable garden. It makes it very easy. No weeds, very easy to tend. The garden socks last a minimum of two years. For more information, you can contact us here at the University of Florida Extension in Volusia County. Our phone number is area code 386-822-5778, or you can visit us on the web at volusia.org slash extension. For Horticulture Today, I'm Joe Sewards. down if your child were here.
And now it's time to go into the studio and join the Director of Community Information, Joanne Magley, and her guest, the Director of Emergency Management, Jim Judge. Thanks, Amber. Well, June 1st marks the official beginning of the Atlantic hurricane season. And while many people are busy planning summer vacations, it's important to make sure you're prepared for a hurricane. So our guest in the studio today is Volusia County's Emergency Management Director, Jim Judge. Hi, Jim. Hi, Joanne. How are you today? Good. Thanks for being here. So let's start with the basic. What is the outlook for this year's hurricane season? Well, that's a great question. And we always enjoy looking forward to the outlook. And you know, while we enjoy it, uh, you know, we're always prepared for the worst case scenario. But right now, it looks to be about an average year, which would be 12 named storms, six of which would be hurricanes, and then three of those could be a category three or greater. So an average year, you know, for the hurricane season. But, you know, as we always say, only takes that one, it right? It only takes one. So tell us a little bit about some of the factors that actually influence hurricane activity. Good question, too. Uh, you know, this past year, we've been very fortunate with the El Nino. And not only has it been very a strong El Nino, they've called it a, a super El Nino, strongest El Nino on record. And it was wonderful last year as it kept all the storms. We had very strong westerly winds that uh, really kept the hurricanes from either forming or if they did form, they didn't last long. So uh, we were very, very fortunate. But also at the same time, this past uh, winter season, a lot of the severe weather we've had from Texas to Alabama, in South Carolina up along the Mississippi have all been blamed on this severe El Nino weather. But we are moving into uh, uh, the next couple of months is going to be what we call a neutral pattern. But then as we get in toward the end of August into September, the busier time of the year, we're going to be into a La Nina. And La Nina means we're going to get easterly winds. So the chance for those easterly flow to actually push the hurricanes toward the coast of the mm -hmm. United States. That's not good news. Not but, good uh, news. I guess we'll just we'll just have to wait and see. So it's been 12 years since the hurricanes of 2004, the three hurricanes that that hit our area. Yes. Do you have concerns that since it has been so long that people are just kind of complacent and and they just don't think you know it'll happen? Well, you know, I think we all hope it never happens to us, but but I do believe there's a certain amount of complacency. And in the state of Florida, I, I think the last I heard was where something like 20 million new residents have come into the state of Florida and certainly into Volusia County. You know, we've got a beautiful place to live here. So we're always out in the community. We just got done with our hurricane expo where we've had a lot of people come up and talk to us about their concerns. So, you know, we're Floridians. We're, we're uh, uh, the potential for a lot of different disasters to occur, not just hurricanes. So, you know, if you get if you get ready for hurricane season, you're going to get ready for the potential tornadoes, wildfires, and all the other things that could potentially come our way. But, uh, you know, complacency is a concern, and you know, the the community can take uh, comfort in knowing that we will come out and meet with them. If there's two folks that want to talk to us about hurricane preparedness, or 200, mm -hmm. we will be more than happy to go to community groups, gated communities. Uh, church groups, have us out. We, we'd love to talk about preparedness and things that people can do under blue skies to get ready. Sure. I remember when I first moved to Florida from Ohio about 12 years ago, I had no idea what to expect from, you know, with hurricanes. What are some of the things you've learned from people that are new to the area that might have surprised you that you didn't realize um, was were, were their concerns? Well, you know, I, I spoke with one gentleman during the expo, and he moved from up north and was quite concerned. But yet he'd already purchased gener a generator for his home. Uh, he had shutters for all the windows. He already had a stock of water. And he said, you know, I just don't want to take a chance. And I thought, I wanted to give the guy a hug. Right. Because, you know, that's as good as it gets. I mean, he was really prepared. But yet I think there's just an unknown. What do I do? Um, you know, I live in potentially a low-lying area. I've got flood insurance. What does that mean for me? So, you know, being able to provide that one-on-one -on -one information to that individuals to be able to help them, you know, address what their family plan should be, and, and to also uh, take into account things that they can do to be proactive to protect themselves and their family. So emergency management is the lead agency when there is a disaster declaration. Does that declaration come before the storm, during the storm? How, does, how, does, how do you become involved? That's a good question. As we have a, uh, say, a tropical storm or a hurricane that's coming our way, and if we can see that we're going to get a category two, three, or even higher that is without a doubt going to impact Volusia County, the county manager can go ahead and declare a local state of emergency. That way we go ahead and we take the protective actions necessary. That puts a little extra emphasis on 
uh, you know, the fact that we're facing something serious. But then there are also things that can occur ahead of the hurricane, ahead of the storm, to allow us uh, a little bit of latitude in purchasing practices and a little bit uh, uh, more able to get ready for that storm. All right, so let's talk now about preparations for residents. Right now, what should people be doing to be prepared for hurricane season? Well, right now, take a look at your family plan. You know, what are your plans? Um, do you live in a mobile home park? Are you in a uh, manufactured home, low-lying areas? Or do you live along the barrier island? And let's say we were going to get the worst case scenario, which would be a, a strong Category 3 hurricane coming in from the Atlantic. Um, you know, there's potential for a lot of things to happen. Where am I going to go? Where am I, where, where am I going to go? What am I going to take with me? And, you know, we, we tell people, too, you don't have to drive 100 miles away. You just need to go inland. Uh, you know, we always say hide from wind and run from water. Mm -hmm. So we definitely want to get people out of harm's way off the barrier island. In that case, in that scenario, we want to get people out of low-lying, mobile home, RV parks, manufactured housing, and get them someplace a little bit more sturdy where they can weather the storm. So that brings us then to the topic of shelters. Now, you know, shelters, as we like to tell people, they're, they're a last resort. Who should be going to a, to a shelter? Let's start with that question. You know, let me, let me start with our special needs population. We, we have individuals in the community who need activities of daily living. They're oxygen dependent. They need assistance with their medications. And yet they live in an area where they should evacuate, you know, again, a manufactured home or a, uh, a low-lying area where they need to get out of those areas to to get better protection but yet they don't have anywhere else to go so the shelters are certainly available our special needs shelters uh, and it's a it's a uh, team effort with special needs where we have the school board provides the facilities mm -hmm. in the school district which is wonderful great relationship there the health department for Volusia County they provide the medical care and sort of the ops operations part of the sheltering then the emergency management role is the registration process so we're always out in the community encouraging people to register for us. You know, we're, I know we're, people worry about getting on a list, but yet we want to be able to care for the people that need that type of service. So in order for us to help the community and help individuals, we need them to register. Right now we have a little over 400 people out of half a million in Volusia County registered. We have done everything we have known to do other than maybe twirling signs out on uh, Dunlawton and right. Nova to get people to, uh, to take it seriously, but yet if we have 5,000 people show up that need oxygen and need certain medical care, it's going to real put a real burden on us to be able to provide the service. Whereas if we have 5,000 registered, then we can plan and prepare for those people at specific special needs shelters. So in speaking of an evacuation, who orders an evacuation order um, and, and how soon does that take effect? How, how many uh, hours or so do people have before, when, when the directive That's a great is question. Given? And uh, Mr. Deneen would be the ultimate decision maker. Our county uh, manager. Yes, ma'am, on any protective actions that we would take here for Volusia County. Certainly a, uh, a decision to evacuate the Barrier Island and low-lying mobile homes. You can imagine, you know, the seriousness of, of that uh, decision. But our job would be to provide Mr. Deneen with his management advisory group that we would be providing Mr. Deneen with the best information available. We're going to be doing conference calls with the National Weather Service in Melbourne. We're going to be on the phone with the National Hurricane Center. We're also going to be looking regionally. You know, what are our partners uh, doing in Brevard County? What's happening in Flagler County? What's happening in South Florida? And uh, then at, at the point that the decision has to be made in order to take the protective actions in order to evacuations, because we want to shelter when it's sunny out. And we want to evacuate when it's sunny out because we want to have everybody sheltered and hunkered down before the start of tropical storm force winds. And that's why we encourage the public that if you have a plan and your plan is to go inland or even get out of the area, leave early. Traffic is going to be bad. Uh, there's going to, the, the, the worse the weather gets, people then all of a sudden get that sense of urgency that maybe I shouldn't have stayed. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they make an even worse decision to get out on the highway at that point. So part of um, the preparedness plan for citizens in our area should also include uh, being able to sustain your, yourself and your family for, for how many days and what, and what sort of items do people need to have on hand? You know, we've got wonderful checklists on our website that people can pull down at uh, volusia.org backslash emergency. And so you put that on the refrigerator and when you go shopping at the grocery store, pick up a couple extra canned goods and put those back in the pantry every time you go. And you know, three, four, five days 
I always say, how comfortable do you want to be? Right. You know, have plenty of food on hand, you know, and comfort food, you know, put some cookies and apples and, you know, those things will last uh, in oranges, but, you know, you can get, uh, you know, um, Oreos and all those other wonderful <laughs> things too. And put that stuff aside. And then, you know, when we get out of the hurricane season, you know, then consume some of those products before you get into the next season. So you're kind of rotating your provisions and, uh, you know, flashlights, batteries, all those wonderful things, and of course the weather alert radio, and then the AM FM radio too, that battery operated or even hand crank, so that if we lose power, you know, you flip that switch, nothing's right. happening, very frustrating. And so what are the weather conditions? Well, you know, turn into that radio, because as you know, right. you are gonna be helping us get the information out mm -hmm. about conditions specific for Volusia County, protective actions people should be taking, and then also providing information throughout the storm. So Jim, you mentioned the website, um, and I guess that's the best place for people to go if they want more information. You know, it's a great website, uh, volusia.org backslash emergency. You can go to the FEMA website, ready.gov. You can go to redcross.org. So there's really good information out there. And I would recommend not just go to ours, but go to multiple sites. Go to the Red Cross, go to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and look at all the information that's out there. Blue skies, life is good. We don't know what the hurricane season will be like. Uh, you know, so, uh, and, and we talked about complacency too in that, you know, I, I, I feel that people are beginning to sense that we've been lucky for a long mm -hmm. time. And, you know, maybe it is time that I go ahead and, and take the provisions necessary to prepare my home, prepare my family. Um, you know, have those, uh, all your records and all those important papers set aside, a little bit of stock of water, you know, on, on site as well as some extra food and items like that. But then again, where am I going to go? You know, am I going to go inland? Am I going to go to mm -hmm. the land? You know, get right. myself a nice hotel room or, or stay with friends, you know, out of harm's way and, uh, you know, avoid the, uh, the drama when a storm is off the coast. All right. Well, Jim Judge, Director of the County's Emergency Management Division, thank you so much for the information. And hopefully we won't be talking to you too much this season. Hope right? not. Except Hope for not. preparedness messages. There you go. All right, Amber, back to you. Thanks, Joanne. And thank you, too, for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here, or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the News tab at the top of the screen to find us. Incidentally, you can find the County Council's meeting calendar there, too. In fact, you can use volusia.org to find out about meeting dates, workshops, topics of interest, activities, and how you can become involved. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Osmond. Have a wonderful evening. <music>